I'm Pete Malinowski and I run the Billion Oyster Project in New York City. And I'm going to give a sort of brief history of New York Harbor, an overview of how we do what we do, and then um, uh, talk about some of the outreach stuff that we're involved in. And then I'll stop and open it up for a discussion. And these, these meetings are always much more interesting and engaging during the discussion portion. So I hope that you all take the opportunity to think of some good questions to ask. And, um, and I hope that I won't be, I'm, you know, I'm sure everyone has different background in ecology and oysters. So I hope that I won't be doing too much of a review from, for all of you. Um, but the, as far as me, I grew up on an oyster farm in Fishers Island, New York, and then uh, became a public school teacher for about five years and developed an aquaculture curriculum for New York City Public School, focused on restoring oysters to New York Harbor, and that led to the development of the Billion Oyster Project as it is today. Uh, so I came at it from the education and oyster aquaculture side. Uh, but I'm going to start sharing my screen and go through the slides. I'm looking forward to seeing you all in a, in a little while for a conversation. All right, so let's make this smaller. Okay, Billion Oyster Project. So our, our goal, our mission is to restore oyster reefs through public education initiatives. And that sh the, sh the equal sharing of those goals around, around ecosystem restoration and public education is what makes Billion Oyster Project unique. And we, you know, care and work just as hard to get young people, volunteers, and community members engaged in the work of restoring oysters as we do in growing and restoring oysters to New York Harbor. And the, fu the fundamental sort of theory of change at Billion Oyster Project is that the best way to engage a, an entire city in restoring the local marine environment is to provide access to positive, constructive, work to improve the natural environment. And so we work to make all of our education programs have work products for students that are of value to the restoration work and to make all of our restoration projects accessible, either you know, uh, in person, hands-on or virtually for students who can't make it um, so that we can get people engaged in, uh, in that restoration work. And we hope that by 2035, we will have restored 1 billion live oysters to New York Harbor and, and engaged a million people in that work. And so we look at our students and teachers and volunteers as you know, working towards that million people mark. And we think that if we engage one in 10 New Yorkers, a million people, that we will have changed the culture of the city and changed how the city uh, relates to the, to the environment. Okay. So a little background, New York Harbor, this is, so this is a, 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 a digital image of Manhattan and New York City in pre-colonial times. So you can see, you can probably see my mouse, this is the, the Hudson River coming down here, East River, and then going out to Long Island Sound here. Um, and it's easy to just think of New York City as a, you know, pavement and buildings, but 500 years ago, this is what it looked like. And um, the, it was one of the ecological treasures of the world. So when Europeans first arrived, or when colonists first arrived in, in New York City, they found a harbor that was totally full of fish and actually said, we'll never need to go to Sweden again for stockfish. There's more fish here than we could ever possibly eat. That, of course, wasn't true. And it only took about 100 years to eat all the, the food in New York Harbor. But at the time, there were so many fish in the harbor that they couldn't physically, that, that ships had to sail through the schools of fish and they could be caught just by lowering a basket over the side of the boat and hauling it back up full of fish. So the harbor was actually so full of fish that they couldn't physically get out of the way of a moving basket in the water, which is a scale of abundance that doesn't exist anywhere on earth anymore because it's all been removed by humans. And the story in New York Harbor is no different than anywhere else. You know the. The backbone of that ecosystem were oyster reefs, 
and uh, you know the, the oyster reefs provide food and habitat for different animals. And it was an entire landscape, 200,000 acres, which is about 300 square miles of oyster reefs. Um, you know that that provided this three-dimensional habitat, food, shelter. Um, you know, protected the shore from storm events. And as you know, early New Yorkers harvested all those oysters, that landscape was removed. And so now the harbor is without its primary habitat type. And as a result, um, you know, all, all of those animals still exist in the harbor, but at a drastically reduced abundance. And we think that by restoring the ecosystem, restoring oyster reefs to New York Harbor, we can bring some of that abundance back and you know, return return some of the uh, biodiversity and bioproductivity to the to the estuary. The story of exploitation in New York City is the same as it is in any other you know, estuary where there's a giant city. So, the oyster oysters were consumed by rich and poor alike. Um, they were put in barrels and shipped all over the world, and it took about a hundred years for New Yorkers to remove all of the oyster reefs from New York Harbor. And this just shows some of the uh, you know, activity in the harbor at that time. And so the, these are the shell middens from the harvesting of oysters. And oyster, one of the big mistakes made in the harvesting is that the oyster shells were also removed with the reef. So rather than being returned to the harbor to allow oysters to settle again on the shell, all that shell material was removed. And that you know disrupts the oyster life cycle. There's nowhere for the young oyster larvae to settle without shell. And this just goes around that same time. The harbor was also being used as a dumping ground for trash, untreated household uh, household waste of so sewage, trash, and all manner of things were just dumped into the rivers and the harbor as a way to get rid of it in for the growing city. And that, of course, wasn't wasn't a sustainable practice and in the early 1900s, people started getting sick from the oysters that were still being harvested. Uh, it came as a huge surprise to New Yorkers that pour, pouring raw sewage on your food supply was unhealthy. And the oyster reefs were blamed for getting people sick. And then um, they got shut down in the harbor. The water quality in the harbor got much, much worse over the next 50 or 60 years as the city grew. And so that sort of takes us to today. Where, right, this is the same the same perspective as that earlier shot. Um, you have this enormous city, eight or nine million people living in a relatively small area. The water quality in the harbor is now much better because we stopped regularly pouring raw sewage and trash into the harbor. The water quality has actually improved to the point where it can support bivalve larvae and um, all these other animals once again. But the New Yorkers carry the legacy of that pollution. So if you ask your average New Yorker on the street what the water quality in the East River is, they'll say it's toxic, it's dangerous to touch, you, know, you can't go swimming in it. Um, and the reality is that it's actually much, much cleaner than it has been, well, than it's been in you know a couple hundred years. But technically the East River is safe to swim in most days of the year. So if it was a beach, it would be open. But because New Yorkers carry that legacy of pollution, that cultural legacy, we have you end up with a city that you know where it's um, a city of islands. Most streets in New York end at the water's edge. Um, many New Yorkers travel over or under one of the rivers to go to work every day when there's not a pandemic. And uh, but most New Yorkers don't identify as living on the water. Don't associate the harbor with as an important natural resource, um, don't identify as living in a port city, and more often than not, when seeking nature, leave New York. Um, and meanwhile, you have a harbor where you, it's possible to see whales and seals and osprey and all kinds of different wading birds and sturgeon and all of these you know, fascinating animals that actually exist and thrive in New York Harbor, but New Yorkers don't have that connection with the natural resource and don't think of the harbor as a valuable open space that should be preserved and protected. And that's kind of where we come in. Our, our intervention, Billion Oyster Project, is designed to change that. And so we hope that by 2035, when, you know, more and more New Yorkers 
look for nature, look for having experiences with the natural world here in town, rather than leaving New York City to find, um, to find that. So how do we do it? The, um, we, as I said earlier, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a um, former high school teacher and the, uh, we developed an aquaculture curriculum based on growing and restoring oysters to New York Harbor. And so these students here are students in the aquaculture class at the New York Harbor School, which is the public high school that we're most closely connected with. And so these students learn the science and business of aquaculture by growing oysters for restoration projects. And here they are, <clears throat> these are seniors in the program who have spent the last three years growing and restoring oysters and they're returning to one of their oyster reefs under the Manhattan Bridge to monitor the success of the reef that's been installed there. Um, Harbor School is what's known as a career and technical education school. So the students specialize in marine fields and spend a lot of their time in the later years of high school working on in those programs. Uh, and we, we've designed Billion Oyster Project to leverage the skills those students are learning in their classes. So as you saw, the aquaculture students are learning aquaculture by growing and restoring oysters. Students in the ocean engineering program are learning uh, you know, how to use three-dimensional design software and build and operate remotely operated vehicles so that they can design our reef structures and, um, and operate these um, remotely operated underwater vehicles that can do some of the monitoring on the reef sites. Students in the marine biology and research program design and conduct the science experiments on our reef sites. And so they're looking at reef development and reef performance, sort of whether or not the reef is surviving and growing and what the direct impacts of the of that reef, what the direct impacts of the of the reef are on the uh, natural environment around it. So we look at um, increases in biodiversity, changes in water quality, whether or not it affects the reefs are affecting sediment transport, and you know whether or not the oysters are reproducing effectively. And the the students in the marine biology and research program design and conduct those experiments. Students in the welding program build all of our reef structures. And so, uh, you know, a given um, acre of oyster reef habitat will take about 300 of these units. And they're made out of uh, steel bars and filled with shells that we collect from restaurants and then set with live oysters. And students in the welding program do all of that construction work. And here are students working alongside their teacher um, deploying reef structures. So these are all getting loaded onto a barge and they'll be um, taken to a reef site and then installed. So that's the, the Harbor School. Harbor School is about 600 students and they, after their ninth grade year, they specialize in these different fields and then work together to, um, to work on these big restoration projects. The other way that we interact with students is through our middle school program. So we work with about 100 middle schools in, you know, throughout all five boroughs, and that's a train the trainer model. So we train teachers, uh, we develop curricula for um, sixth through eighth grade. And the, the goal of that is to, any, is to match the standards that teachers are required to teach their students but develop content that's all through the lens of New York Harbor and oyster restoration. And so when students are learning about how nutrients flow through an ecosystem, rather than see a picture of prairie dogs and snakes, they see a picture of oysters and osprey and oyster toadfish and lobsters and crab and shrimp and seahorses and blackfish and striped bass and sturgeon and all the animals that actually live in New York Harbor. <clears throat> and so traditionally, Without intervention, New York City public school students will go through their entire um, their, their entire schooling without learning about the natural environment where they live. And we're working to change that by developing curricula and training teachers on, how, on this new way of teaching. The other thing you can see in this picture, so this is a, this is these are Billion Oyster Project staff members who are dropping off an oyster cage to this, these uh, students here and their teacher. 
And right here, this line hanging off the bulkhead is what we call an oyster research station. And that's the centr central cog in this educational experiment. Experience is a uh, small cage filled with oysters that acts as a remote lab that students go out into the field to monitor. And so they look at, they'll pull up the cage, look at oyster growth and survival, um, what other animals are attracted to the cage, water quality and general site conditions. And all of the learning they do in the classroom uh, prepares them for success in those field expeditions. And we have about 150 of these oyster cages all, all over the, uh, all around the city. Hopefully none of you get dizzy looking at this slide, but the, um, this is a community reef project. So in addition to the large scale restoration efforts and the oyster research stations, we operate commu a community reefs program. And these are smaller scale on bottom installations at the few places in New York City where you can actually walk down into the water. So this is Coney Island Creek here between Coney Island and the rest of Brooklyn. And it's a pretty polluted waterway still, but getting, um, access to restore oysters here has led us to understand the water quality conditions better and help find points of sources of pollution and work towards cleaning it up. And these students are all at local schools around Coney Island Creek and they come together to, to do the restoration in the creek. So we also operate a shell collection program at about, um, well, in normal times. So last year, um, our shell collection program was at 80 restaurants and we collect about 10,000 pounds of shell a week um, from those restaurants. And now we're at about 20 restaurants and uh, you know, ju just under a thousand pounds of shell a week because a lot of restaurants are still closed. But this gets the outreach component of our work also because this truck drives around New York City five days a week, spreading the word, you know, passively spreading the word about Billion Oyster Project, but also about this partnership we have with Talisker Single Malt Scotch. So they fund our shell collection program and they have a vested interest in getting the word out also. And so this is a good partnership for us because it, it, it uh, pays for the shell collection work, but also serves as a vehicle to get our, our message out to a broader, you know, to a whole different group of New Yorkers. People who eat at fancy restaurants and eat oysters and people who drink scotch. And um, so that's just an example of a partnership that allows us to, to get the word out and, and um, you know, get our work done. And these are just, this is just some examples of some, some collaborative marketing that we've done with Talisker to um, raise awareness and um, build support for that program. We had a major, um, in June, we had a major increase in our ability to produce oysters. So the this is a new remote setting facility that we put together in Red Hook, Brooklyn. And these four tan shipping containers were actually modified as, as tanks. So we painted them with a, with a food grade epoxy paint, added plumbing, um, aeration systems, and, and water heaters. And this allowed us to dramatically increase our setting capacity. And so the, here you can see the uh, water coming into the tank uh, the, the reef structures that were all built by Harbor School students and filled with reclaimed shells from our restaurant partners being added to the tanks. And then this, this is a full tank down here. And um, once, the, once the reef structures are in the tank and the, and the water and the, uh, and the water, we add oyster larvae to the tank. The larvae swim around, attach the shells. And the result, um, you know, each one of these tanks can produce 10 million uh, what we call spat on shells. So young oysters attached to the shells and the reef structures. And then once they're attached, the whole tank can actually be lifted onto a barge for deployment. I think I have, yeah. So this is, see if I can show this video real quick. This is, uh, this is the deployment. So this is a large scale reef at the mouth of the Bronx River. And you can see these same tanks are, oops, sorry, are on the, on the barge and the reef structures are being lifted out of the tanks and deployed. And the big advantage of this is that we can keep the oysters wet for the whole deployment process. So that allows us to take very young oysters and bring them to points far away and um, you know, spend a few days doing the deployment without killing all the oysters. And this just shows the, uh, you know, the restructure that we created here. So these are 
sorry. These are the, the reef units that we built that are going down. And then this is a protected area behind the reef units where we'll do um, you know, more uh, sort of loose shell and spat on shell restoration that um, can only survive if it, if it has some protection from the waves. So this is an example of sort of an armored, armored shoreline to protect the, the uh, more vulnerable restoration work behind it. And the other thing you can see here is our young spat on shell. So these are shells that are collected from restaurants. It's a hard clam shell and these are oyster shells. And on each shell, you can see all the young um, spat that have attached here. And so these shells after a year, um, you won't be able to see that host shell anymore. It'll just be a big ball of, of oysters. This is a, uh, the, the, what, what I was just sort of referring to after a, after a year in the water, those reef structures, you, you can't even see the mesh anymore because the oysters grow out through the mesh. And the idea is to replicate what an oyster reef would look like if it had you know, sort of hundreds of years to grow. Um, and eventually the steel mesh will degrade away and you'll just be left with the, the live oysters there. And you can see obviously by looking at this picture that how the, there's a ton of interstitial space between the live oysters and the, uh, you know, creating habitat for lots of different critters. Okay, so in, you know, about, about a year ago, when New York City shut down because of the COVID-19, we had to totally shift how we were doing our, how we were working with students and teachers. Our whole, you know, most of our effort prior to this time last year was focused on getting students and teachers to the water's edge and bringing people together at community reef sites and volunteer days on Governor's Island and relying on restaurants where patrons are sitting together to um, you know, get our shell collection done. And it's all changed overnight when New York City shut down and everyone was, you know, went home to their apartments. And so we had to figure out if we couldn't bring people together at the water's edge, how could we get New York Harbor into people's homes? And that was a, a, that effort was all about bringing our educational uh, material online and interpreting it in new ways so that for teachers who were teaching remotely for the first time and for parents who were managing their, their, their young children at home while also doing their jobs, their day jobs um, had content that they could teach, get, get their students involved and access New York Harbor in a virtual way. And so this takes took many different forms. These little videos sort of showing New York Harbor to students at home and um, you know, talking about the different waterways and how we work um, in these sites to, um, and what, what the uh, oyster installations look like. Let's see if I can get the, uh, so here's, here's one of the oyster cages coming up. You can see that. And then, you know, everything from that to uh, story hours. So books that relate to New York Harbor, we do these uh, read alouds that uh, parents could show their, their kids at home. And then here, are, this is one of our, uh, one of our reef sites in Queens, just showing the, the animals that live there. So we made a lot of video content and also um, created these training videos on how to implement our curricula at home, you know, even without any teaching experience so that parents could, could do that with their, with their kids. And this is a, just showing how we do the monitoring of the oyster research station. So the same thing, even if you can't get down to the water's edge, you can still learn about oyster reefs and the animals that are associated with them and how to determine how, how well your oysters are doing. These are just some of the critters we see regularly in New York Harbor, just to give you all an idea of what's actually there. You have a mud crab, oyster toadfish, it's a predator, oysters, redbeard sponge, line seahorse, botulus, which is a tunicate, it's an invasive tunicate, and then um, oyster drills. And I don't know if you all have these, but they're uh, also predators of oysters. So these guys will drill, drill holes in the top shell of an oyster melt the meat with sulfuric acid and then suck out, suck out the juice. So they're sort of voracious predators of our oyster reefs. And I'm just gonna close here with a few slides showing uh, New York City from our perspective. 
So you don't usually see New York City this way, but this is just a little ways off the southern tip of Manhattan. And it gives you an idea both of the, you know, the great beauty of the harbor, um, how big it is, and also how vulnerable New York City is to the harbor, right? And we think about, there, there's few cities in the world that are, point, that, that need to change as much as New York City to survive the next hundred years with sea level rise and, uh, you know, as a result of climate change. And, but what we hope New Yorkers do during that time is not only you know, le learn how to exist in a city that's increasingly vulnerable to climate change, but also learn to experience New York, New York City from the water. And you have this great open space that's the same size as the city itself, the land area of the city. And it really is a spectacularly beautiful um, natural space. And we hope that by getting New Yorkers engaged directly in the work of restoring New York Harbor and improving the natural ecosystem where they live, that more and more New Yorkers will connect with New York Harbor in that way. And, um, and through that work, sort of change the relationship that the city has with the natural resource. And I think that's, I know that's it for my slides. And so now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hopefully you all can turn your videos on so I can see, see you. And uh, we can have some, uh, you're happy to answer any questions you may have or hear your feedback, advice, on how to do this better or anything else. And I just wanna uh, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring and a lot of work you did there. And I'm really great to see what is possible. <laughs> um, yes, I don't know if uh, how we can do this the best that uh, can we, how, does every anyone has a question? First come, first serve, we'll say. <laughs> Luke, I see Luke, okay. <laughs> uh, hi Pete, that was, uh, I mean, I was in awe of your project to begin with, but I mean, now it's just kind of, wow, it's moved so quickly and it's amazing. I had a quick question about how you engage with such a wide background of students. Do you have to put extra effort into that or do you, find that they come to you or is it kind of just naturally happens? Well, I mean, I think there's there's two parts to that question. One is, you know, how do we, just how do we do our outreach to students and teachers? Um, and then the other is the wide range question, which is a really, really good one. Um, so interesting thing about New York City, New York City is one of the most diverse cities out there. And every name in New York City is different, has a different set of priorities, different, you know, uh, cultural backgrounds. And so de designing an intervention that, you know, both on the curriculum side and the restoration side, that has the impact we want to have, but is also, you know, um, works for all of these different groups is a real challenge. And so that, that comes from listening to, you know, going into community and hearing what their priorities are, what their interests are, what their challenges are, and, and learning from that how, uh, you know, the, and just sort of adapting how we train teachers and how we develop curriculum so that it's more culturally sensitive to the different places we work in without having a thousand different types of curriculum, right? So that, that, that's an ongoing tension and one that we continue to work at. And then the, on the outreach side, we do a lot of outreach. So we have, uh, you know, we're constantly getting in touch with new schools, talking to teachers, having events to encourage teachers to you know, learn more about Billion Oyster Project, reaching out directly to ad administrators at schools and also parents and students. Um, you know, the benefit in New York City is that <clears throat> New York City Department of Education is enormous. There's 1,700 public schools, 120,000 teachers, and 1.1 million public school students. So that it's a big pool to work in. So if if one teacher doesn't want to work with us, we can always, you know, generally find another one. But the, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of direct outreach. Uh, some some folks reach out to get in touch with us, but we do a lot. You know, our ground game is going into schools and talking to teachers all the time. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Hannah was the next one. Hi, uh, so yeah, Hannah Lee here from um, Scotland working on the DEEP project. One of the questions I had, and sorry if it got answered within Luke's because my internet disconnected for a second, um, was 
you're talking about kind of this issue of the disconnect um, with the population of New York to their water source. Are you also partnering up with, say, recreational groups to get people out on the water when, like, the water quality is high enough to swim? So, for example, paddle boarding or people learning to scuba, if that's even possible, snorkeling, things like this. Because I've reflected on some of the visits we've had where you say, yeah, that, that's in that lock right there. Um, you can snorkel. And they're like, can I? <laughs> it's like kind of just not even having the idea that they can do those things. Yeah, so, so I mean, we do scuba dive in New York Harbor as part of our, um, you know, the there's a harbor. I didn't show a slide, but there is a harbor school program all about scuba diving, and we do that. That's some of our monitoring that we do on reef sites is is scuba diving. Um, and <clears throat> I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that we directly partner with recreational users, but we try to share, not you know, share information and drive people to those to those different programs. So if we know about an event coming up, we'll, you know, point our, our friends and constituents towards it. And we're all part of the same community working to kind of take New York Harbor back. And so that's definitely, I mean, the other issue with New York Harbor is that while the water quality may be safe, the harbor is not necessarily safe in all, all different places, right? Because it's, it's an active commercial port and there's a ton of current. And so there's a, there, there are some places where it's safe to be in the water in New York Harbor, and there's definitely some places where it's not. And so trying to educate our constituents on how to do that. And but we rely on other other organizations that there's a lot of human power boating, you know, paddle boarding or rowing or kayaking. You can, there's free kayaking all over the city that you can find. So we sort of point people in that direction. Okay. Uh, thank you. Then it was Anna Maria next. Yes, hi. So good to see you, Pete. Good, good. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear all the updates. You know, when, even when I was visiting and we were collaborating a while ago, there was an issue of collecting the shells and you were collecting your shells and placing them on a governor's island to age. And it's a big issue, not only in the United States where, you know, like for example, in Boston, Cape Cod, in Massachusetts, there are different you know, issues of collecting the shells and using them for restoration. And we have a similar issues here in, United, in, uh, in Europe. So is there any shift or change uh, in your collection of oysters from the, oyster shells from the restaurant and from fishing industry maybe? Is it still aged and stored on a governor's island or is there other, um, I, I, uh, you know, some advice is how we can, you know, address that because nobody wants those shells in their backyard and usually we use them and place them in a recycling um, uh, places where the garbage is like on the Cape Cod it's recycling area but for example now in Ireland when we are trying to do a very similar project for restoration we don't we can't find a place where we're gonna uh, um, store those those oyster shells yeah, um, so we still do all of our, we, we, we do all of our shell curing on Governor's Island. Um, mm -hmm. So we have about, you know, we've collected 1.5 million pounds of shell over the last few years and a lot, and it, almost all of it has been cured on Governor's Island. Uh, one thing, um, you know, there, there's every, every year there's, a, when, the, you know, when the weather's cold, there's no, there's not, you know, there's mm -hmm. no odor associated with shell, right? Mm -hmm. But then yes. there's a couple of weeks every year when the weather warms up that it smells bad. But the rest of yeah. the time, um, if you're just, you know, it's not, you have to be pretty close to it to, to, for it to be a bother. Yeah, yeah. Governor's, yeah. Island. Governor's Island is a public park and there's a million visitors a year who come out there and, and we've managed to keep our shells without any problem. Um, okay. For us, the, the, the shucking houses that are within. So, <clears throat> you know, um, a couple hundred years ago, there's a lot of oyster shucking that happened in New York City mm -hmm. and in the surrounding area. But now the, the market is entirely a half shell market. So the oysters are shucked at restaurants. So the only place to get oyster shell for us is directly from the restaurant. In other parts of the world where oysters are cl or clams are, are shucked in mass and canned or jarred and sent, sent around, th those are better sources for shell than what mm -hmm. we have. The restaurant shell collection is incredibly labor intensive and expensive. Yes. So by the time the shells reach us, they, we've spent about 50 cents on every pound of shell. 
um, mm -hmm. which makes it, as far as you know, a construction material mm -hmm. very, very expensive. It yeah. works for us. Yeah. It works for us because the the um, you know the outreach value of working with restaurants meets our goals of mm -hmm. reaching a whole lot of people, and is something that we've been able to find funding for. So we we, we don't have to you know justify the the cost in the same way. Um, but there's not there's also not many places that have such a high density of restaurants that serve oysters as New York City. Mm -hmm. so it's a little bit of a you know, I don't know how sustainable that would be in a, in, a, in a smaller city, for example. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Thanks very much. Okay. And uh, Lizzie, I thought I saw your hand. <laughs> um, hi, Pete. Thanks. That was very interesting. Um, I was particularly interested um, when about the containers that you were using um, to put the reefs in and sort of the aquaculture side. So, um, I was asking how long you kept uh, the oysters in there when you're putting the spat on and is it like a recirculation? Is it oxygen pumped in? How does it work? Yeah. So there's, um, the, the, those containers are standard shipping containers, open top 20 foot shipping containers. And, and the, the way that we do it, which I think is relatively standard, but the, so we, we put the shell shell in the tank in this in the, and then we fill them with water and we hold the water there for three days and that those three days allow a biofilm to develop around around the shells and that makes it more attractive to oyster larvae and then we drain the tank fill it through a one micron screen so it's you know take all the solids out of the water because any solid any solid solid bigger than 50 microns will uh, you know an oyster larvae will settle. We fill, fill the tanks, warm them up as quickly as possible, which takes us a couple of days to bring them up to 28C. And then um, and, and then once they're up to temperature, we uh, aer aerate the tanks very gently and add the oyster larvae. And the air at that point is mostly just to, to mix the tank so that you have an even distribution of larvae in the tanks. And then once they've set, we give them a couple of days to set. We'll drain them periodically over a screen to see how many of those larvae are still swimming around. Ideally, none because they've all attached to the shells. And we get a setting rate that we're happy with. We'll uh, we turn the water on, and then it becomes a flow through system. And so the temperature drops down to ambient, you know, over the course of a day. And then we run, you know, the idea is to turn over the whole volume of the tank three or four times a day. And that provides the, the young oysters with enough food. Um, we don't feed them until that point. So the um, just relying on the metabolic reserves of the, the egg cells to survive for the first three days. But then we run the tanks for a week or two until the oysters get to, you know, about 10 millimeters and then they're ready to go out. So you, there's enough food in the water to support them then? It's just uh, coming straight from the harbor? Yeah, there, there's plenty, plenty of nutrients in New York Harbor. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Okay, anyone else? Uh, see a hand. It's hard to get an overview. Yeah, Cordula. Yeah, thanks very much. That was very um, yeah inspiring, as Corina said. Um, I have a question in regard to your, I suppose, um, putting them back in the water then with their their reef structure. Do you like how do you identify the right location? I mean, you said obviously, you know, Hudson River and Estuary um, would have been an oyster, um, well, natural oyster reef anyway. But um, here in Dublin, for example, we're looking at, you know, old oyster banks and, and beds from, you know, I don't know, 16th, 17th century. But we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to find the right location to regrow them or re you know restore them here um in that on that scale so like do you do you actually identify locations um and how do you do it and yeah or how do you go about that um because obviously i'm sure um the structure has changed of of the bay of the estuary uh, yeah 100 percent so <laughs> 
Um, that's we do look at we have looked at where historic oyster reefs were, um, but we also kind of make the assumption that everything is different, right? So there's some there's some things that still hold true, like the salinity gradient going up the Hudson River, right? That's that's always been there, but the um, the shoreline is all totally different, and the way the water moves is totally different because of it's all hardened shoreline. Um, and so one thing that may be interesting that I, I'll, I'll show you real quick, if I can, just as far as um, just give a quick tour of, of New York Harbor. Um, bear with me for a second. This is this cool application called Google Maps. You guys know about this? Uh, the, uh, so if you look at and I can't get this silly thing out of my way, so I can, let me just do this real quick. Um, if you look at New York Harbor, right, it's enormous. So this is, we think of New York Harbor is going between Breezy Point and Sandy Hook, the lower bay here, all, all the way, you know, around Staten Island, out into Western Long Island Sound and all the way up the Hudson River. Our oysters, 1 billion oysters, will go on an area of land the same size as Governor's Island. So if you watch Governor's Island disappear as you look at the scale of the harbor, right? It's, there's, compared to the, you know, that's 200 acres compared to 200,000 acres. So we're not talking about restoring the landscape in any way on the scale of what, what used to be here. We're talking about a tiny little fraction of what used to exist. And so that's just a way to say that there's, that we're not trying to, um, you know, we're hoping that by restoring a billion oysters, we can get the population back to where it can grow on its own. But what we look at are these little sites like in, in Gowanus Bay or in Red Hook or in, you know, these creeks, or this is a great one for us, Bushwick Inlet. The few places in New York Harbor where the where the harbor kind of, you know, where, where there's some protection and some uh, opportunity for water retention and an appropriate bottom. So that's what we, there's so much uh, soft sediment in, in the harbor where our restructure would just, you know, settle in and be completely covered. So we look for appropriate bottom and areas where there's some opportunity for water retention. So these little creeks and bays, um, and we can pretty quickly get up to our 200 acres using those you know those sort of handful of sites but our, our our restoration sites are are spread out all the way into jamaica bay you know into west long island sound up the hudson river along the brooklyn shoreline and we're just trying sort of using a shotgun approach to see where it works best and then how we can scale up from there cool thank you cheers uh, janet Can't hear you yet. Yeah, we can't hear you yet. <laughs> yeah, my, my comment uh, seems a bit redundant after your last comment because I hadn't got really a grip of the size of things. But I, I'm trying to remember why you're talking about, I saw uh, something in New York where they built a, a beach and they said at the time, they say, oh, the New Yorkers, they, they, you know, no one can use it for, you know, to go swimming. And I was thinking, oh, don't they know about the Billion Dot Oyster Project? And um, have you heard of this beach that they've constructed? And, and in view of what you said about water quality, would it in fact be safe for them to bathe off the beach? Yep, so there, there, there are a couple of man-made beaches in the... I mean, New York City has great beaches, uh, you know, in, in, on the Rockaway Peninsula, and you know that are on the on the ocean, uh, but but the, those aren't really in town. So the, the the beaches you're referring to are there's um, you know one is in in Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is right across from the East River from Manhattan, and that is uh, we actually have an oyster reef going in right near there. Um, because th the rules of the park don't allow people to bathe at the beach, you, and uh, um, but the water quality 
I mean, you just need to be aware of the, of the environmental conditions that affect water quality. So if it's rained in the day or two prior to when you want to go swimming, you shouldn't go swimming in, in the East River. But if it hasn't rained, then it's, it's just, uh, it's perfectly safe to swim. Yeah, I, it was just when, when I actually saw the program, I thought of your project. And then also in your talk, you kind of put it in perspective, say only one in 10 people knew of it so far, but it must be growing very rapidly, I'm sure. That's what we hope. You know. yeah. Pete, you're putting a lot of material in the water. Did you have to get permissions from the municipality or licensing agencies, or is restoration so accepted that they can't say no? No, they, 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 they can always refuse. So, <laughs> we, spend, we spend an enormous amount of time applying for permission to put our oysters in the water. So every, every oyster that goes in the water requires permission from the U.S. Coast Guard, the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Army Corps of Engineers, the, um, you know, the city, the landowner, sometimes the state. Um, and so we have, and on a, a typical year, we'll submit between 3,500 and 5,000 unique pages of permitting documents to various, you know, state, local, and federal agencies in order to get permission to put oysters in the water. Um, so it's a, it's a huge burden. The it's completely backwards, right? We have to do the same, apply for the same permits we would have to do if we were installing a bridge or a shopping mall in order to put an oyster reef in the water. Um, and we've when we first started, the largest oyster reef we could get permission for was 50 square meters. And then um, over time, you know, each year we ask for 10 times the area that we're expecting to be given permission for, and that gradually increases. So now we're permitting sites that, you know, sort of the five acre size. And so we've just slowly chipped away at that. Uh, but the I mean, our oysters are seen as an attractive nuisance. So they're seen as a public health hazard because if you eat them, you can get sick. And that makes it, that makes it complicated to get permission. Um, there's a million, a million rules to try to keep bad things out of the water, but there's no rules to help put good things back in the water. So that's, a, you know. Uh, okay. So, so you have a, a, quite a large team then working on, on that, obviously. Yeah, so, um, we have so we have 32 full-time staff and about three full-time staff members who work almost exclusively on getting the, those permissions wow that's a lot um lizzie had another question so i don't know where you are but <laughs> sorry i i'm i was just wondering all the students that you have do they like to eat the oysters as well it's just in this country, people don't eat oysters as much as maybe they do there. Um, so we um, we don't do a ton of eating oysters with students. We do we do some. So at the New York Harbor School, every year before the winter holiday, uh, the last day of school before the holiday, we do an oyster bar for all, all the students, and it's a um, you get a wide range of reactions from students from you know there's absolutely no way i'll eat that to okay i'll try it to yes i like eating it so it's a, it's, it's a w wide range but it's definitely not something that public school students in new york city have a lot of prior experience with and that's sort of interesting too you know the back in the day oysters were uh, every, everyone ate oyster oysters and now it's more it's a, it's a sort of a luxury product so the restaurant in new york city buy an oyster for Two dollars or three dollars a piece. It's a, they're very expensive, so it's not a you know universal food anymore. But do you think you're converting more people? Yeah, I mean the, the e e eating oysters. It, um, you know it's it's not sort of it's it's not directly related to our work, right? But but we're 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 riding the same oyster wave that oyster farms and restaurants are riding. So this increased enthusiasm for oysters and spending lots of money on oysters to eat them is translates well to increased enthusiasm for oyster restoration. And do you have any ideas what could be done in the UK to help? Yeah, I mean, the I don't I don't know the geography that well or the 
the politics, but the, what, you know, the, um, you know, I think there's a, I imagine there's a strong appetite towards experiential education and hands-on learning and finding ways to engage schools. Um, the advantage of working with schools is that you have the, this uh, captive audience that are, are looking for ways to be more engaging. And so if you can create something that's easier for teachers to do and makes their lessons more engaging and more interesting and also achieves the goal of restoring the local environment, then you know, theoretically that's something that can just build on itself. Um, but the, you know, what we do that's the, um, you know, I, I think makes Billion Oyster Project unique in some ways is we rely on young people to do a lot of the, you know, I think that there's a tendency in the environmental science and environmental restoration community to only rely on adults with PhDs to do the, 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 um, the, you know, the thinking and the working behind restoration projects. Now, what we say to all the teenagers in New York City is, you know, please help us solve this complex problem. This is your ecosystem. You have the power to restore it. Let's work together to make that happen. And so by breaking down that barrier, by, by making the program accessible to young people and relying on, on young people to do that work, I mean, that's the most powerful thing about Billion Oyster Project. You know, how, how can you expect young people to be responsible if you never give them any responsibility? Thank you. So uh, we have a question in the chat because the microphone is not working, so I will just read it. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if there has been any additional or unforeseen ecosystem services or measurable benefits from this work that might help generate more support. So anything you didn't expect before starting? I mean, the, <clears throat> the biggest thing, it's always surprising the, um, you know, the the abundance and diversity of life in New York Harbor is always surprising. So, you know, finding seahorses, the fir first time I found a seahorse, that was surprising. And the first time, um, and, you know, just without fail, wherever we put an oyster cage, after a few weeks, you pull it up and it's just full of animals. And so that, um, but I mean, that's surpri it's, it's surprising. It's also not because the reason we're doing it is to restore the, the habitat and to increase biodiversity. Um, and so I don't know that there have been any you know, surprising new ecosystem services besides sort of habitat provision, you know, water clarification, water water quality improvements, and stabilizing the the short the bottom. Yes, Felina. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for that talk. It's it really is inspiring. I I second Luke's uh, Luke's statement about how impressive it is to see it all uh, laid out like that. Um, I have one very short question, which is, do you have a hard stop in three minutes or? I have a, um, not quite. A soft stop. A soft stop. Yeah. All right, we'll wrap up. <laughs> um, and my second question was relating to your uh, earlier statement about education outreach linking into teachers. I'm interested to know of the online tools you put on uh, and made available after the onset of the COVID pandemic how much engagement that you saw online was through existing relationships that had been forged prior to the pandemic and how much were you seeing new traffic? Most, most of it is through existing relationships. Um, we did have a couple, a, a few of our videos got, you know, many, many more views. Uh, and you can see uh, the remote learning resources are all on our website, so billionoisterproject.org, you can see that. We had one how to make a hydrometer at home video that got 20,000 views. We, we have no idea why. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> um, but the, uh, but so it's mostly through existing relationships. You know, we haven't, and I think there's always a, a, a tension between making something that, you know, has broad appeal and making something that, you know, really changes teach, what teaching and learning looks like. And I think that, you know, we're the same as, any learning app that you can down, you know, a language learning app that you can download on your phone or anything like that. And we're trying to balance that. How do you reach a large, a, a broad audience while also still, you know, making people better at what you're trying to do. Um, and, and because we deal with public school teachers and public schools, um, our, 
you know, the, the, the curriculum requires a lot of training and support. And um, so th those relationships we have with teachers are really valuable. And we do a lot of work through our existing relationships. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, then if I'm allowed, I would have a one, another maybe last question. <laughs> um, and maybe that's also interesting for a lot of the European projects because most of us are just starting our outreach activities and some of us are also working with schools. So my question would be, how did you start this? How did you start this now project? Um, what, what would be the first step to take for our little projects over here? <laughs> The, the the first step was the, um, the the New York Harbor School is a very unique public high school, so there's probably not maybe there are maritime trade schools where you all are or you know science research high schools, um, but the the first step was just was uh, you know working with students to restore oysters and finding ways to make that part of their school curriculum, and then it just sort of went from there. Um, and, and we found some funding, right? I mean, that's the other big thing is finding foundations or um, you know, government agencies that would support that kind of work. Yeah. Okay. So you, you just started with one school and tried to build that up from there to, to transfer it then to other schools as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So I don't know if there are any other questions, but it's already one minute past four. So. Um, yes, then thank you very much uh, for you being here. I think it was very, very exciting for, for me at least and to, to see what is possible. And I think we're all very motivated now. <laughs> I, I am at least. And yeah, then for those of you who want to stay and maybe exchange what you do in your projects in Europe already, or I don't know, do some discussions. <laughs> afterwards we can i would still stay a bit but uh, pete you can of course go you have your day in front of you <laughs> all right well th thank thank you all very much for having me i really appreciate the questions and it's good to see some familiar faces anna maria and janet who i haven't seen in a long time i nice see you all and the um thanks for having me and ch check us out on our website and never uh don't feel bad about getting in touch about anything okay thanks a lot <laughs> thank you Bye.